Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. Hot button topic, evolution. What happens when your pastor decides that he's going to oppose uh, creation? going to disagree with the Genesis account and try to find a way to finagle and to fendagle and, and maneuver in, in evolutionary theory and say it's totally, up, it's totally okay for you as a Christian to believe in evolutionary theory. This is the episode where we're going to listen to Andy Stanley talk this way, and then I'm going to give you an, a, a good biblical argument against it. Aside from Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, which by themselves are a great biblical argument against evolution. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit more oomph behind it, if you would. And then I'll, I'll give you some resources on how to do some research on this so that you can uh, you can bone up and be ready to deal with this. Because evolutionary theory, oh my goodness, it, it, it isn't even science. Uh, you know, and I'll explain why I believe that. So uh, let's let's whirl up the desktop. So desktop is whirled up, and here we have Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley. Hmm. And uh, funny thing about this particular soundbite. So it was originally published back on April 11th, 2023, by the dissenter.substack.com folks. Uh, you can find them at, at d i s n t r uh, on Twitter. And great account to follow. I mean, they put some solid stuff out. And when they posted this up, I asked, I asked them, do you have you know, where the original sermon is for this? And they couldn't find it. It's like, oh. Uh, <laughs> I, like to, I like to see things in context. But alas, in this particular case, I'm not able to. And you're going to note that that's not going to make any difference. But um, you know, what do we do as Christians? How do we defend the biblical creation? I'm going to give you a great argument to defend it. And uh, and a free resource with that. And then also I'll give you some bibliography. But uh, So note here, the dissenter has noted that Andy Stanley, denying the creation account, says God only tells us about creation in Genesis to, quote, accommodate our capacity. That, that's right. You're going to find out why did God that, you know, if we evolved from grandma and grandpa amoeba uh, who jumped into a tree and then became apes and then fell out of the tree as human beings, uh, why then why does the creation account say that God created the heavens and the earth in six days? Solar days, by the way, there was evening, there was morning, uh, the first day, 24-hour days. Why, why, why does it say that? And, and, and so apparently it's because humanity was just too stupid. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Apparently Andy Stanley's capacity is much greater than the rest of us. Well, actually, I think Andy would say that human capacity is much b greater now than it was, you know, you know 5,000 years ago because apparently, anyway, you get the idea. So he, Andy Stanley's figured this out. He knows what God means. So li listen to this. This is... This is breathtakingly brazen heresy, but uh, let's listen. There is no necessary conflict between evolution and theism. What? <laughs> there is a conflict between evolution and Christianity. Christianity isn't mere theism. See, I, how many seconds did I get it? Four. I got it four seconds into this. And, uh, and already I have to comment because here's the thing. Theism is a philosophical position that basically says, I believe in the existence of a God. Do you know that worshipers of Zeus are theists? Did you know that worshipers of Shiva, Vishnu, and uh, deities like that, in fact, worshipers of Allah, they are theists. There is a necessary conflict between evolution and Christianity. Keep that in mind, and I'll explain why there is a necessary conflict, because if it didn't go down the way it, it describes it in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we're in trouble, because Jesus affirmed that. Uh-huh, I'll explain. Let's keep going. Because evolution is a means Theism says there was an agent. There. <laughs> One person. <laughs> Again, Christianity isn't mere theism. I have one high school biology. 
Yeah, evolution is a means, but the scripture says that, that, that that's not the means by which we were created. We were created by the word of God. As you teach your Christian here, it's like, please, would somebody make this clear? I know this is like really important because people come home, kids come home from biology class, high school, like, well, you know, but evolution, no, we don't believe in evolution, we believe in creation. Wait, 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 wait. hey, hang on. This is very important. The Genesis account of creation, the point of that isn't here's how God did it, uh, really? <laughs> Hang on a second here. <clears throat> hmm. okay. All right. Uh, see, I, I, I have a biblical text like running around in my head at the moment. Just have to. Um, so Hebrews chapter 11, right? Faith is the assurance of things. Hope for the conviction of things not seen. Okay. Yeah. Check this out. Okay. Hebrews, the, 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 the divinely inspired author of Hebrews would disagree with Andy Stanley here. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, by faith, we understand that the universe was created, and here's how, by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. How was the universe created? By the agency of the word of God. That, that's, that's a, that's a fas fascinating thing here. Uh, so um, this, the, the divinely auth inspired author of the book of Hebrews disagrees with uh, Mr. Andy Stanley. Shock of shocks, right? And, and, and let me give you just a little bit of background on this. Okay, so if we go to like the Gospel of John chapter 1... Okay, Gospel of John, chapter one, and arche en halagas, kai halagas en proston theon, kai theos en halagas. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right, and you'll note that the the en arche here in the beginning that corresponds with what's going on in the, in the Genesis account in Genesis chapter one, uh, where it legitimately says Barashit bara Elohim et hashamayim va et haeretz. Okay, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Bara created. It says created and then how did he do it okay so here you have the account saying the earth was without form and void darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of god was hovering meta cafet uh, hovering like a bird this is an avian verb hovering over the face of the waters the uh ha -ha -mayim. and god said let there be light and there was light look at that the word of god spoke Huh, let there be light. How, so it does tell us how this worked. It worked how? Through the word of God. So in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Whom? Through the halagos to theo, the word of God. And without him was not anything made that was made. Yeah, so we we got so we got a we got some problems here, and that is is that uh, Andy Stanley is basically uh, contradicting other passages of Scripture while trying to find a way to to brush aside that embarrassing text from Genesis chapters one, two, and three. Ah, oh, we got we got to get rid of that because uh, my atheist friends think I'm a I'm a complete rube, and they won't invite me to their Christmas parties because I believe in the creation. So we have to find a way to get rid of it. So l listen again to what he's doing. This is sophistry. I believe in evolution. We believe in creation. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, hang on. This is very important. The Genesis account of creation. The point of that isn't, here's how God did it. Mm -hmm. The point of that is that God did it. And the reason we know that is because it stood in stark contrast to the Sumerian and the Babylonian and the Canaanite and the Egyptian creation myths. Uh-huh. Yeah, it, 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 I, I've never heard these other creation myths. What do they have to do with anything? God is telling us how we got here, and I, I don't. It, it doesn't matter what the other creation accounts were. The Egyptian one is gross, by the way. It's 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 legitimately gross, but uh, yeah, it has more to do with Gnosticism than anything. And in all of their myth, the gods just sort of appeared magically out of nowhere, or they created themselves, or they created each other, and then Yahweh says, "Hang on, uh-uh." 
I created it all out of nothing. I didn't use body parts, okay? I didn't, you know, split, you know, Tiamat in half and their lower half became the earth and the upper half became the heavens. I mean, that's foolishness. There's one God, I'm God, I did it. That's the point of the Genesis creation count. It's just that God did it. It doesn't matter how he did it. Yet, Hebrews says that the world was created by the word of God. Hmm. Hmm. Now, now this is important. God, as a heavenly father, does something for you and does something for every generation from the beginning that we should be so grateful for. And if you're a parent, you do this as well. You know what God does? God accommodates to our capacity. <laughs> Watch where he goes with this. It, it's so bad, and I'll, I'll, I'll teach you how to unpack this and unwind it. God accommodates to our capacity. Where do babies come from? It depends on who's asking, doesn't it? And you didn't lie to your five-year-old when she asked, and you didn't lie to your 15-year-old when he asked, and when a high school biology student studies reproductive you know, science, the teacher isn't lying. You, we never lie. We change the answer. Why? Because we're lying? No, because we're accommodating to a person's capacity. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, yeah, the people of the ancient world, they just couldn't understand evolutionary theory. And so God was accommodating. It's like telling a three year old, you know, who asks, Mommy, where do babies come from? And he'd say, Well, there's a stork that comes and delivers babies. Uh huh. Yeah. That's, that's literally his argument. And boy, is this a mess. So, come on. What was the capacity of ancient, 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 ancient slaves? I'm pretty sure the ancient people had a pretty good grasp of reality and that God wasn't just accommodating them by telling them a myth akin to the story. Slave culture Hebrews. It, was there any way in the world God could explain to them how he did it? No. There's but he, he did. Again, the book of Hebrews completely contradicts you. Again, he, Hebrews... He, yeah, Hebrews, that's that coffee, uh, that coffee book in the book of the Bible. Uh, yeah, by faith, we understand that the universe was created, how? By the mechanism of the word of God. We're told exactly how God did it. And you'll note that the book of Hebrews is written a long time after, long time after uh, the, the book of Genesis. So, yeah. So, again, how, how do we unpack this? How do we deal with this? And I'm going to uh, give you a resource. And uh, years ago, I wrote an article, and this is up on my old blog, at, at the captain's blog at, at piratechristian.com. It's been a while since I've updated that. I, I might have to figure out how to do that again. I, you know, get back into the, into the um, habit of writing. But the name of the article from January 30th, 2014, it's almost 10 years ago. Uh, it, it, the, the article is titled, The Greatest Biblical Expert Who Ever Lived and His View of the Bible. And, and so I'm at the time, the postmodern liberals were still kind of a, a vexing problem. And so I, I was going after the postmodern progressive. But here's the thing. Andy Stanley is legitimately a postmodern progressive. Okay, so here's the, how this is how all of this should work. And this is why you need to understand that there is legitimately a full on conflict against Christianity and evolution, not theism but Christianity. And here's the reason why. Okay, now we're going to talk about, again, the greatest biblical expert who ever lived and his view of the Bible. So in the article, I'm going to read portions of it. I'm not going to read all of it, and we'll put a link to this below as well as to the books that I'm going to recommend. Before we look at Jesus' opinion of the scriptures, it would be prudent for us to first be reminded of Jesus' credentials, okay, and his authority regarding the scriptures. See, you can pin everything on Christ, by the way. His his credentials are impeccable. And here's the thing. Uh, by virtue of the fact that he rose from the dead, um, his credentials are better than any Bible expert today. It just, let's just be blunt. So when we examine the eyewitness testimony concerning Jesus that is recorded for us in the contents of the four biographies, those are the Gospels of the New Testament, we learn that Jesus claimed to be none other than the one true God in human flesh. He, that's exactly what he claimed. Any nut or lunatic can claim to be God, but proving such a claim is a whole other 
issue. And and so there's there's a joke that I, I learned along the way when I was being trained as a Christian apologist, talking about the fact that anybody can acclaim to be God, proving it's a different thing altogether. And the joke goes something like this, uh, that there was a, a, a man who was touring these insane asylums of France back in the 1800s because the conditions were deplorable and they were trying to figure out a way to improve the conditions and make them more humane. You know, an insane asylum is not exactly a great place for any human being to end up. And so as he was touring these different insane asylums, he visited one particular insane asylum and, and, and he was doing a tour of the facility and it just so happened to be during that time when, when the, uh, the entire population of the uh, of the insane asylum they were all together in one big room it was like wreck time or something like this you know, back in the 1800s version of it and he saw a fellow who was uh, who was wandering around inside of the the common room there and he had his hand in his jacket and he was strutting around kind of looking important and so uh, the the guy who was doing the tour said to that fellow he says hey uh, who are you who, who do you think you are you know why are you behaving this way he says I am Napoleon Bonaparte. And he said, really, you're Napoleon Bonaparte? Okay, well, how do you know that you're Napoleon Bonaparte? And, he's, and he thinks about it for a second. He says, God told me that I am Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh, God told you. And no sooner does, you know, does he get that out of his mouth that God had told him that he's Napoleon Bonaparte, some guy from across the room from, you know, starts yelling out, no, I didn't. I never said that he was Napoleon Bonaparte. That's a complete fabricated lie, right? And the whole point is, is that anybody can claim to be God. Proving it is a whole other issue. And the thing is, Jesus proved it. He proved that he is God in human flesh by raising himself from the dead. So... The uh, fact is, Jesus proved his claims to deity by raising himself from the dead uh, 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 three days after he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Now, the men who authored the New Testament documents were also eyewitnesses of Jesus' life, teaching miracles, and his bodily resurrection from the dead. Since Jesus proved his claim to being the one true God in human flesh by raising himself from the dead, there is no greater authority, living or dead, on the subject of the Bible than Jesus. I would think about that, okay? So some somebody can say, well, I, I have four PhDs in theology, and therefore I know better than everybody else. Yeah, but did you raise yourself from the dead? <laughs> because if I, when it comes to everybody's opinions, nobody else's opinions matter. The only, the only person whose opinions matter are Christ, straight up. Okay, so there's no modern sci there's no scientist, modern scholar, biblical critic, regardless of the number of degrees that he or she may hold, who can speak with greater authority on the subject of the Word of God than Jesus Christ. This is absolutely true. Therefore, if you want to call yourself a Christian or a Christ follower, then you would do well to pay close attention to what Jesus believed and taught regarding both. Old and New Testament scriptures and bring your thinking and your convictions in line with Jesus's convictions. Just work with me here. So Jesus's view of the Old Testament, creation and Adam and Eve. Okay, so what exactly did Jesus believe and teach regarding the Old Testament stories? Did Jesus consider them to be mere man-made mythological stories? Or <clears throat> did he believe them to be accurate accounts of real events that took place in real history. Here we should say, did Jesus believe that the accounts in the Genesis in the book of Genesis were were, were uh, well mythological stories meant to accommodate the uh, the immaturity of humanity at the time because of their 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 low capacity for understanding hard difficult things, right? Okay. So what did he believe? Okay. We'll answer these questions by first reviewing Jesus' thoughts regarding the stories concerning Adam and Eve. So in Matthew chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, the eyewitness biographer, the, the Matthew, the tax collector, he records this exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees. And the Pharisees came up to him and they tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. 
Uh oh. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Jesus is quoting from Genesis here. Uh, and uh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So, so the topic that the Pharisees were testing Jesus on was marriage and divorce. And Jesus' answer tells us a lot about his view of the book of Genesis. First, Jesus points the Pharisees to Genesis as if it alone provides the authoritative answer to their trick question. Then Jesus quotes Genesis 1.27, as if it literally meant what it said. God created him, male and female, he created them. Then Jesus quotes Genesis 2.24, as if literally it literally meant what it said. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There was no equivocation on Jesus' part. No hint that he secretly believed that the opening pages of Genesis contained a man-made poetic creation myth, or that it was historically inaccurate, or that this was just something written to kind of tell us that God did create, but we don't know the real means of it because we need to accommodate for the stupidity of the ancient world, right? That, that, nothing like that at all. In fact, Jesus' answer makes it perfectly clear that he was a creationist. And this should come as no surprise to anyone because Jesus is the God who is revealed in the Old Testament. Furthermore, Jesus' answer also reveals that he believed that Adam and Eve were literally the first two people that he created. In other words, think of it this way. Jesus is an eyewitness of the Genesis account. He was there. He's the one who said, let there be light and there was light. That's the whole point of these other texts that say that the universe was created by the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God in human flesh. All right? So challenge question here. So if you call yourself a Christian or a Christ follower, yet you don't believe that the story of Adam and Eve is historically true or accurate, uh, what authority, here's the here's question, what authority are you basing this belief on? Huh? Okay. Is it right for you to call yourself a, Christ, a Christian or a Christ follower when your view of the scriptures is at odds with Jesus's? Why should I believe you over Jesus? In fact, that's a good way to kind of think about this. Why should I believe Andy Stanley over Jesus? I shouldn't. Because he said, well, the idea of evolution and theism isn't at odds, but Christianity and evolution are greatly at odds because here's the thing. If the Genesis account isn't true, Jesus is a liar and he's not a good man and he's definitely not your savior and he's not God in human flesh because God can't lie. You see what I'm saying here? All right. So, uh, yeah. So next part of this, by the way, um, this is some. This is a little bit more to it. I'm not going to read all of this, but uh, you'll note this applies then to the flood. This applies to Jonah and the large fish, all these other things here. In, in Matthew 23, uh, verses 34 through 35, Jesus says, Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of innocent Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Now, wait a second. Abel. Hmm. Abel is one of the sons of who? Adam and Eve. He was the one that was killed by Cain, another of the sons of Adam and Eve, the first two people that God created. So if the story of Cain and Abel were a mere man-made myth, you know, uh, then Jesus' claim that he would hold the Pharisees accountable for the blood of the righteous from Cain to Zechariah, uh, would, uh, sorry, from Abel to Zechariah would be simply meaningless. After all, how do you hold someone accountable for mythological blood that was never actually shed because the person who supposedly bled it never historically existed? Uh-oh. So it's a challenge point number two. So having a lesser view of Scripture and denying that Adam and Eve were the first literal human beings created by God, denying that Cain and Abel existed, and that their stories are accurately recorded in Genesis, turns Jesus into a moronic buffoon. 
right? After all, according to the eyewitnesses, Jesus actually believed the Genesis accounts to be historically accurate. In fact, a little bit of a note here. Back in the day, um, before I got blocked by <laughs> Tony Jones of the Emergent Church, uh, he, he was one of these guys who started, you know, he, he, was, he was taking all of his followers and, and taking a hard left turn. And one of the things that he was attacking on his Twitter account back in the day was the creation account and basically trying to make room to embrace evolution evolutionary theory as as a Christ follower, you know. And so I challenged Tony Jones. I tweeted at him and say, you are aware that that Jesus believed the creation account to be true and that he believed in Adam and Eve and, and Cain and Abel. You you are aware of that, right? And his response to me was, well, if Jesus were growing up today, Jesus would have been an evolutionist. Really? Again, that doesn't make a lick of sense. And the reason why is because Jesus is God in human flesh. God can't lie. Jesus was there on the day when God said, let there be light and there was light. Jesus was there when the Trinity was discussing amongst themselves and saying, let us make man in our own image, in the image of, uh, you know, the, the, Christ was there. So uh, we got a big, <laughs> like huge problem here. And so that's the way you go at this. Okay, now, that's a simple way of basically saying as a Christian, I'm not going to contradict Jesus. I trust Christ. And and I and there's no way that Jesus is going to lie to me. And since he rose from the dead, I always like to challenge people this way and say, as soon as you rise from the dead, after you've been dead for three days, I'll be willing to listen to your counter argument. Until then, I'm going with Jesus. Just keep it that simple. I think that's helpful. But if you want to go farther, if you want to actually kind of say, well, what is the evidence out there? Evolutionary theory is a theory in crisis because it's bad. It's not even science. It's just, a, it's, it's, have you noticed it hasn't become the law of evolution? There's a reason why. So let me give you a little bibliography here. And uh, some stuff easy, other stuff more challenging, and kind of work our way up from that, okay? First book. That's absolutely a great primer in learning about the, the case for actual creation, okay? The, the case for the Genesis account, Lee Strobel's book, The Case for a Creator, is, is a great book. It legitimately is awesome. This is a great place. If you're going to start somewhere, this is the place to start. So get The Case for a Creator, this is your primer into it. Where do you go from there? You go from there to this book, Darwin's Doubt, okay, by Stephen Meyer. Great account, okay? This one just takes evolutionary theory behind the proverbial woodshed, mm -hmm. and there, there's, a, there's a beating that, <laughs> that takes place behind that woodshed. And Darwin's Doubt is brilliant. That's a great, great, uh, great book to read if you have, and you can get it. Unlike audible.com, it's, it's, it, you know, if you, if you're into audible books, this is a great one to, you know, to listen to while you're working out or you're driving in your car and you, or, or things like that. So Darwin's Doubt, great place to go. Another one is, uh, same author, uh, a Signature in the Cell. Okay. And you'll note that DNA science now completely rules out. <laughs> evolutionary theory it's it's no uh, it's <laughs> so at the uh, signature in the cell uh, dna and the evidence for intelligent design now this one isn't exactly an argument for christianity this is a, an argument against evolutionary theory based upon dna and the concept of of intelligent design and then the fellow who taught me how to do uh, counter evolutionary apologetics uh, dr a e wilder smith he's now with christ but back in the day he wrote a book and it's a great book. It is a fantastic book. It's a little higher level written at uh, uh, kind of a scientific level, so it's not an easy read, but the name of it is The Natural Sciences Know Nothing of Evolution. The Natural Sciences Know Nothing of Evolution. In fact, if you're really looking for good resources, uh, if you go to the archives of um, of the Fighting for the Faith podcast. Let me see if I can do this here with you all with me. I'll go to piratechristian.com and we're going to go to the uh, podcast 
archives, and I'm going to put in Wilder and just see, see if I can find, see if that's the keyword that will help us find this in the archives. And the, one of the lectures, uh, it was, it just came up, and then it's, sometimes this doesn't behave well. Uh, let's see if I can get this to behave properly. Um, uh, let's see here. All right, I'm going to retry this. I'm going to go to piratechristian.com. Hang on a second. Go back. Okay, Wilder. And let's see if I can get this to work. All right. There we go. All right. Is man a machine? Time and creation. Uh, the bankrupt theology of Biologos. So if you type in just Wilder in the uh, search bar at piratechristian.com for the Fighting for the Faith podcast, you'll find some old lectures that I've posted uh, from A.E. Wilder Smith. And you might have to, you know, kind of scroll through it to find, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, is biogenesis scientific by Dr. A.E. Wilder Smith? That's part of what we put into those episodes. So you can find some of the older episodes. And Dr. A.E. Wilder Smith is the guy who trained trained me in uh, counter-evolutionary apologetics. Now, I, he didn't do it one-on-one, -on -one, but I attended and participated in classes. And in one of the lectures, you can actually hear me ask Dr. Wilder Smith a question. But, uh, you know, that that's, uh, that's, that's for another day. But you get the idea. So those are resources. And what we'll do is we're going to put links down below to the books. Uh, and uh, and then we'll put a link to the uh, the greatest uh, Bible scholar, Bible expert who ever lived, uh, and his view of the scriptures, and uh, and then re recommend take the time to go back into the archives of the audio podcast of Fighting for the Faith and find those lectures by Dr. A. Wilder Smith and listen to them yourself. They are fantastic to help you because as Christians. The science isn't behind evolution at all. The science is all in favor of creation, and the creation and the evolutionists hate this fact. It's absolutely true, though. So I think you get the idea. So hopefully you found this to be helpful and a good resource to kind of help you think about how we as Christians are to approach the subject of evolution versus creation, and uh, and give you some homework so that you can broaden out your understanding and at the end of the day be able to stand, you know, to have confidence that Christ knew what he was talking about when he affirmed the creation account in the book of Genesis because Jesus would never lie. Plus, he rose from the dead, and nobody else even comes close to his credentials, yeah, because he's God in human flesh. He was there. He was there when the Ruach Elohim was metakafeting over the, the deep, over the Tehom and the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So big shout out, by the way, and a big thank you for everyone who, uh, you know, who is a member of the Fighting for the Faith crew. You make it possible for us to do the things that we are doing here at Fighting for the Faith. We truly cannot do what we're doing without your support. I want to thank you. And if you'd like to join our crew, the information on how you can join the crew is down in the description of this video. And so until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. Amen.